Open your Bibles, please, now to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 13. 1 Corinthians, chapter 13. Many chapters in the Bible are known by an epitaph, such as uh, 1 Corinthians 15 is known as the resurrection chapter in the Bible. And uh, so we have faith chapter in the Bible, Hebrews chapter 11. Well, chapter 13 in 1 Corinthians is known as the love chapter in the Bible. Now, 1 Corinthians 13 actually starts in uh, verse 31 of chapter 12. It, uh, it's a continuation of the thought. And so he says in chapter 12, verse 31, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. And uh, the words here are the words that I show unto you a superlative way. I show you a most excellent way. This way that I'm showing you is superior to all other ways. And then he introduces chapter 13 with, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, I become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never fails. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. Now, in this passage of Scripture, the word charity is, uh, is the Greek word agape, uh, and it's the same word that's used when it speaks of God loving the world, and it's the word that's translated in the Scriptures uh, 86 times as love, and 27 times it's translated as charity, the same word. Uh, the word charity is used by the authors here because the word means love in expression. It's not love that stays down inside the heart, but love that finds expression. That's why he uses charity. Uh, when we have charity, when we're expressing that love in some action, and that was the idea that he has given to us here. Now, he says that this love is the most important thing that you can think about. Think about what he's saying here for a moment. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, now I don't know what the tongues of angels are. Because every time the angels are mentioned in the scriptures as speaking, they spoke the known language of the people, whether it was Hebrew or whether it was Greek, they spoke the known <laughs> languages. But there may be an angelic language that they speak in heaven when they refer to the heavenly Father and all the angels above singing those hymns. So they may not use English. They may use some other language that we don't know and the author here is saying, even if I could speak in some language that angels would speak in, and he said, even if I had all of the languages of men and could speak all of them, he says, if I have not love, I become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. In other words, a, a cymbal, you know what a cymbal is, so it's made out of brass. And he says it's a clashing symbol. It's not something that's making any music. It's making a clamor. And he said, if I could speak with these angelic tongues, or if I could speak in any of the beautiful languages of the world, and yet if I have not love, I'm like a symbol that's crashing together, making a clamorous racket. 
he is saying that love is superior to any kind of gift of being able to speak in any languages whatsoever. Now, you know and I know that on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit of God was given and uh, those men spake with languages. It was the gift of tongues. And uh, to defend, divine it, he says, I want you to know that there's, they spoke in, uh, in Hebrew language, they spoke in uh, Aramaic, they spoke in Greek, uh, the Koine Greek. He, in fact, he lists 18 different nationalities, 16 different nationalities plus the Judean and the, and the Hebrew. He lists 16 different languages that were spoken on that day. There was no unknown jibber-jabber or any gibberish or any foolishness. The Holy Spirit's not to offer foolishness. But what was, it was known languages. And he lists 16 of them. And he said, you know, if I could speak in all 16 of them, well, wouldn't that put a little pride in your heart? And then he said, if I could speak like an angel speaks, whatever language that is, yet if I'm not filled with the love of God, if I don't have real love that is expressed to God and to others, it's like a clashing noise, a clamorous racket. That's how useless anything like that would ever be. That's how superior love is. Real, genuine love. That's the love of God that's expressed through our lives to others. Now look at the second verse. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge. Wow. Now, I don't know of anybody uh, who is a prophet these days. In fact, when the last prophecy of the book of Revelation was written, uh, he said, if anybody adds to the prophecy of this book, I'll add to him the, the plagues that are in the book. So uh, prophecy ceased when the book was finished. Amen. Uh, and, uh, you know, we don't need any more prophets today. We had prophets in the New Testament, though, because they didn't have a completed Bible. And uh, so God revealed those things to them by the Holy Spirit. And we needed prophets in those early days. And not only so, but some of them were given understanding of mysteries. They were the mysterious things. And uh, Paul said that the Lord revealed to him the mystery of the church. That is that the church would be made up of believers all over the world who are baptized by the Spirit into one body and who constitutes the bride of Christ. Man, that was something not revealed in the Old Testament. These are mysteries that were now revealed, and we needed those who had the gifts, who had the, the understanding of these mysteries. And then all knowledge. There was a gift of knowledge in the early days also. Before the Bible was written, before the New Testament Scriptures, God would give people special gifts of knowledge to let them know things that they needed to write down to give us the New Testament. We would not have had it had not God given them the gift of knowledge. But you know what he said after the Bible was completed? He said, preach the word. Be answered in season, out of season, to prove, rebuke with all long-suffering and doctrine. And, uh, you know, there's nothing to be added to it. This is a completed word. Amen. It is plenary. It is complete. You cannot add to it. Let me give you an illustration. Let me show you what I mean. If we had prophets today, who were real prophets of God, then a prophet, what he spoke, was just as authoritative when he spoke it as when he wrote it down and put it in the book. Watch this. If somebody had a gift of prophecy today like they had then, they could add to the Bible. If I had the gift of prophecy like that, I could add another John. You already got four. You see what I'm saying? That's why he said the Bible is complete and where there be prophecies, they shall cease. And they ceased when the Bible was completed. Now, they needed the ability to speak in these different languages also because there was no written book. The New Testament wasn't written. And so they were given the ability when one would speak, Another one would interpret to someone back there, someone come into the congregation, they might have some Spanish people over here, they might have some Greeks over here, they might have some other people all over, and God gave them the ability to speak to those people and interpret what was said by the speaker. 
But he, he really restricted it a whole lot. If you'll read 1 Corinthians 14, he said in a, any given service, it could be two or at the most three who could speak in those languages, and it had to have an interpreter. And if he didn't have an interpreter, he had to keep silence in the church. Amen. And then he said it had to be done in order, that is in course, one at a time. Not confusion, because God is not the author of confusion. You just read the Bible, and the Bible explains it very, very clearly in, uh, in the Corinthian letter here. But now, even if we had that ability to speak in all these languages, and we knew all these mysteries, and we had all of this knowledge, it would be to us nothing. And have not charity, I am nothing. Now, the, the literal on that is I am an absolute zero. Uh, you know, a, 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 a nothing. A zero with the sides knocked off. That's what you are if you don't have love. If love is not what motivates us, then we're totally separating ourselves from what God is doing in this world. Everything God does is in love. Everything. It's, it's love for his holiness and love for his righteousness and love for his truth. But it's also love for people. He gave his son. He that spared not his son, but freely gave him up for us all. How should it not with him also freely give us all things? He has done everything possible for us because he so loved us. Think about that. It's the most amazing thing in this world. You see, uh, we can love those who love us pretty easily. You know, some people you just like, you know, you meet them and you just say, well, that's a great guy. I spend some time with him. Maybe we'll go out to lunch, maybe we'll go fishing, do something. We just love the company. That, But then there are some other people that are a little harder to love. I don't know, maybe you don't have that. Uh, but uh, some people are just a little more difficult because they're surly and, and, uh, and argumentative and sullen and envious and jealous and all that other kind of stuff that you don't want to fool with. You know, God loved us while we were yet sinners, rebellious against God, turned our backs on Him, and He loved us while we were yet sinners in Christ died for us. Think about the love of God. And he said, you know, if I had all of these uh, wonderful, wonderful gifts, and uh, he said, then if I had faith that I could remove a mountain, well, that'd be great, wouldn't it? I mean, wouldn't you like to have that kind of faith? Jesus said one time as he was uh, standing over the Jordan Valley and he was looking down and he saw a Mount Hermon over there, different ones, he said, you know, if you had enough faith, you could say to that mountain, be thou plucked up and be cast over here into the sea. Talking about the Sea of Galilee. If you had faith, you could just do that. Oh, wouldn't that be wonderful to have that kind of faith? That you can move mountains? Wouldn't it be wonderful? If you had that kind of faith, and you didn't do what you do with the love of God, and because you love God, he said you're a zero. You're nothing. All that would be absolutely, totally meaningless. Look at what he said. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. Do you see what he said? All my goods. He said, if I took everything I owned, all of it, and gave it to feed the poor. If I sold my house and my car and my clothes and I gave everything I had to feed the poor and then have love, it would profit me nothing. If I'm not motivated by love, if love is not the compelling thing in my life, if it's not the love of Christ constraining me, then everything is void and vain and useless. That's what he's saying. And then he said, though I give my body to be burned, in other words, what he's saying here is if I were to sacrifice my life as a martyr, if I were to lay down my life for Christ, and yet I did not have love expressing in my life, if, if love was, was not coming out of me through uh, to others, then he said it profits me nothing. Give everything you have, and it would profit you nothing. You see the superior value of love. What he's saying, love is more important 
than any other single thing. You imagine all of the gifts that you could have. You imagine all the sacrifices you could make. Imagine all the knowledge and faith that you could accumulate and put it all in one pile, and it is rubbish. It is zero if you don't have the love of God in your heart. Everything we do must be motivated by love. Our love for God, our love for our Savior, and love for others. Now, if I'm serving and I'm doing it out of duty, that's not going to get it. Now, if I do what I do because I have to do it, that's not going to get it. If I do it because I'm wanting a pat on the back from somebody else, not going to get it. If I do it because I love my Savior, and the people that he loves, I love. Then it's going to be profitable and good. You see what he's saying? This is one of the greatest chapters in all the Bible. In fact, this chapter just kind of stands out. It's one of those glorious chapters. It's like a, a precious jewel when you read the scripture and, and hear this chapter about love. About how God loves us and then how we are to have his love in us and let it motivate us in everything we do. Now I'm going to put this in a little bit of different terms uh, so we can apply it in our life. Okay. Now start back at the beginning. Though I could stand up and teach a Sunday school class or give a testimony and could sing like an angel in the choir or in a class. And I'm not motivated by love. I'm like a clanging cymbal. And though I have great gifts, I have studied the scriptures and I know the word. And, and though I know good illustration to illustrate the word. And, and though I get together with you folk and we can just enjoy a great time. And we talk about the great mysteries about the second coming of Christ and state of eschatology, eschatology and pneumatology and sortiology and all the other ologies, you know, that these, uh, these uh, theologians talk about. If we had all of that knowledge. Knowledge and didn't have love, it's zero. It's zero. Though I come to church and I pat everybody on the back and shake everybody's hand and smile real big to everybody, if I don't have genuine love, it's nothing. Though I put my tithes and offerings in there and even sacrifice and get hard and give uh, deep, deep, dig down deep and support missions and buy up by the bus and all of those things. If I did it all and yet I'm not motivated to do what I do because I love my Savior and I love souls. If I don't do it because of love, the Lord doesn't even write it down in the book. I didn't even give it. Look what he says. And though I lay my body down, I give everything I have to put it in the benevolence fund. And though I give to every poor person in the county and the three county area around us, and though I then lay down my life as a martyr for Christ, and I don't have love, if love's not what motivates me, it profits me nothing. Do you see how important love is? I pray the Spirit of God will impress on our hearts deeply. I mean, pierce our hearts with His Word and let us see how important, how vital it is that what we do is motivated by love. Now, I want you to see some of the things He gives to us now. There's the negative and the positive here. He says uh, in verse 4, Love suffereth long. In other words, love can put up with a whole lot of things without being unloving. That's what it means. It, it doesn't become unloving. It puts up with a whole lot of things. I've had so many people say, well, you can only take so much. Then I can, I can love, but then I only take so much. Then I can become unloving, and God expects me to do it. No, 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 he doesn't. God expects you to never be unloving. Are you reading what he said? Did he say love suffers long? It'll just keep on. And keep on, and keep on. Even when that person is irritable, 
even when they just get under your nerves, even when they like a scratching down the toe board. Oh! Even when all of that comes, you still cannot become unloving and be like your Lord. Don't make excuses for being a well. I'm a Yankee, so I can be yeah. I could be unloving. No, you can't. Not walk with God. Yankees need to be kind and sweet too. Well, it's just my nature. We'll get changed by the grace of God and allow love to be the thing that motivates you instead of that old sinful flesh. Notice what he says: Love suffers long and is kind. It's never unkind. Love is always kind. Is that what your Bible says? Are you reading it on here? Love suffers long and is K-I-N-D. Kind. Anytime a man is unkind to his wife, he's being unloving and unchristlike. Anytime a woman is unkind to her husband, she's being unkind unloving, unchristlike. Be kind. Somebody's going to have to get on the altar here. I can see that coming. <laughs> Look what else he says. He says, love envieth not. Did you know what he's saying here? This is the word of God. You believe the Bible. This is the word of God. This is not the word of the Baptist church. This is God speaking. God put this in here. And he said, God said, love envieth not. Now envy, that is when you see something that somebody has and you put it down and uh, you uh, like to have what they have instead of having them have it. Now somebody has ability to sing on key. And you're envious because you couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. <laughs> then you're being unkind because you're being envious of what somebody else has. Somebody else has a new car. You are envious and you wish that were your car. Uh-oh. Now you're envious and you're not walking in love. Love teaches us if somebody gets a new car, you rejoice. Say, boy, I'm glad you got that car. Amen. You know, it's just, it's the story that's given. And, and I love the little story about the fellow that pulls up in a big, brand new Jaguar. Black Jaguar is just a gorgeous, beautiful thing. And the guy gets out and, and there's a young man standing there. And boy, he looks at that car and he gets a look at him. Oh, I said, that is absolutely a gorgeous car. It's just beautiful. And he said, uh, boy, oh boy, oh boy, I said, uh, where'd you get that car? And the man said, well, I'm going to tell you the truth. He said, my brother loved me so much that he came into some money and he bought me this car and gave it to me. And the man said, the boy says, boy, man. I wished I could be a brother like that. That hey, he wasn't envious of it, but he just wanted something to give to somebody else to help him. Look what he's saying here. Love envieth not. And then he says, it vaunteth not itself. It's not puffed up. You know what that means? It's not full of pride. Pride is the opposite of love. Pride, the Bible says, goes before fall and the Holy Spirit before destruction. The Bible says God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. The Bible says in the words of Jesus, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. In due time, he'll exalt you. The Bible says that we ought to be humble before God. But two, it's so easy to be full of pride because we, after all, know more than anybody else. We're prettier than anybody else. We wear better clothes than anybody else, drive better cars than anybody else, got better education than anybody else. We can speak better than anybody else. So I mean, after all, why shouldn't we be full of pride? <laughs> Shame on us. Shame on us. He said, uh, vaunteth not itself. 
doesn't push itself up, doesn't try to make a name for itself. He said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That's what he teaches us. Don't vaunt yourself. And then he says, is not puffed up. And that word uh, is it's a word that they used to use the bellows, you know, you, you guys know what a bellows is. And when you get that fire going and you get all full of yourself. That's what he's talking about here. You know, uh, we must be very careful. We really must. You see, and to be full of pride, to lift ourselves up, and, and to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think, puts us out of the will of God and it puts us in a place where we can be in communion with the Lord and having his full blessing on our lives. It, it hurts us. It's bad for us. It's bad for you to be full of pride. We, we have nothing to be proud of anyway. Let's be honest about it, folks. We're just sinners and we're saved by grace. The only thing good in us is God in us. And so let's realize that there's none of us that have anything naturally good in us and in fact, the Apostle Paul said, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. No good thing. It's all what God does that's, any worth, that's worthwhile. That's any good in any degree. And so he said, if you're full of love, and this love is being expressed, it will not be puffed up. It does not behave itself unseemly. That is, in an, in an unbecoming way. Uh, love is not going to get out there and do things that are hurtful to other people and behaving itself in an uncomely way. And then he knows, uh, knows else, what else he says. Uh, love seeketh not her own. Mm. Uh, over in Philippians, he said, let every man seek the good of others rather than for themselves. You know, we need to be others-minded. Others, yes, Lord, others, let this my motto be. Help me live for others that I might live like thee. Jesus came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for others. And so then he said, he said, is not easily provoked. Did you get that? Is not easily provoked. Uh, have you ever been around people that just seemed like they had a chip on their shoulder? Just waiting for you to knock that chip off. You go over there and say, well, you know, just knock it off. Just knock it off. I'll, we'll fight. We'll rumble. We'll rumble. And, and you know what? That's just not a good thing. Where does it not be easily provoked? And what he's saying is, you can't make me mad no matter what. You just can't do it. I'm not going to get mad. You can just do what you want. But here's that mental attitude you must take. And that is this, if you can make me mad, you're controlling my life. It's not the Lord controlling me, you are controlling me because you are making me mad. Well, if somebody else has got control, then the Lord doesn't have control. I just refuse to let anybody make me mad because I want the Lord to have control of my life instead of that person is not easily provoked. Look at what else he says about it. He says, thinketh no evil. Now, the words here, thinketh no evil, they're very interesting words. Uh, in the Greek language, it means you don't write down and keep a list of all the things that you want to get even with somebody about. You know, there's some people who keep a list of all the hurts. Jesus was uh, with his disciples, and one of the disciples asked him, Lord, I'm feeling real religious today. Let me ask you this. How often should I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Seven times? <laughs> Look at me. I'm willing to forgive him seven times. Whew. Lord, you're going to give me a crown now, or are you going to wait till I get to hell? I mean, I'm, after all, I'm willing to forgive him seven times when they do something wrong. Jesus looked at him and said, 
I say not to seven times, but until 70 times seven. You mean, you mean I gotta keep track of 490 offenses? <laughs> now I just give up. That's what the Lord said, I want you to do. I don't want you to keep track of the offenses that somebody offends you with. He said, don't think evil. Don't think to get even with anybody. Do you know what he tells us in other places in the scripture? He says, if somebody does you wrong, turn it over to the Lord and let the Lord be the one who gets vengeance. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Just turn it over to the Lord and let him take care of it. That's what we're taught to do. If somebody does us wrong, say, Lord, you know what they did. I'll just turn it over to you and I'm going to keep on living for you and serving you. Look what else he said. He said, rejoiceth not in iniquity. Why, well, it does not laugh at sin. Fools make a mock of sin, but among the righteous there's favor. You see what he's saying? We don't want to look at somebody. You see somebody staggering out there, they're drunk, and you make fun of them? No, no, no. You feel sorry for somebody that's out there and has, has, has gotten drunk. You say that poor soul has been misled. He's been deceived by liquor and, or drugs and, and the devil's making mock of him and you join the devil's crowd and you make mock at somebody because they're trapped in their sins. Don't do it. Just don't do it. He said, you don't rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Rejoice in that which is good and truthful and right in the sight of God. Now notice what else he says here. He said, beareth all things. Now that again is a repetition of the thought that it will bear whatever comes without becoming unloving. That, that's an interesting uh, play on the Greek here in these languages here. When he says bears all things, he's talking about a thatched roof that bore the the wind and the rain and the bad weather and protected that person. And that it bore all of that bad stuff and they took shelter underneath it. And, and actually he said that love covers a multitude of sins. And you know what we can have, we love people, we're, we're gonna put up with them and we're gonna bear with them. Often we talk to uh, Couples want to get married, and we talk about the bears that you have to have in your life. And that's bear one another's burdens, and then forbear one another's faults. I mean, just put up with them, because everybody's got weaknesses, and everybody's got strengths. And so, put up with those things. Nobody's perfect, except Judy. <laughs> anyway, uh, love, he said, is something that'll help you to bear all things. Believeth all things. That is, it's not skeptical about things. It takes things at face value and doesn't look for something underneath as some of bad motive or false idea underneath. It accepts things until proven otherwise. That's what he's saying. And then he's saying, and hope with all things. In other words, he's saying he sees the bright side. That's literally what it means. Uh, a Christian who's full of the love of God is going to look at a, the bright side of things instead of the, the dull side of things. I mean, uh, you probably have seen this, a glass, uh, the professor had the glass on the table and it was half full, and he said uh, part of the class will say, that glass is half full. And the other class will say, the other part will say, that is half empty. <laughs> and he said, what do you think? And the guy walked up and drunk it down, he says, I think it's all empty now. But anyway, <laughs> the thing is, a Christian, one who has the grace of God, the one who has the love of Christ in him, will always look on the bright side. Always look on the bright side. Do you know what he says over in Philippians? Finally, brethren, what sort of things are true? What sort of things are honest? What sort of things are just? What sort of things are pure? What sort of things are lovely? Whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Not a single one of those things are negative. Get out of that negativity. Get out of it. It's going to hurt you spiritually if you're always looking down and looking for the bad instead of the good. 
He says, love, if it's expressed in your life, this kind of thing will cause you to be so full of joy and light, you'll always be looking at the bright side instead of the dark side. Now look what else he said. He said, uh, it endureth all things. You know, it seems like he's repeating himself here, doesn't it? But I think he's saying it because it's a little hard for some of us to get it through our thick skulls. And so he says it three or four different ways. Suffers all things, endures all things, bears all things. What he's saying basically is absolutely nothing should keep us from being loving. Nothing should ever move us off of this mortar that we have. Nothing should take us off of the solid rock of the love of God and the love of God being expressed in our lives. In, in the book of Romans chapter 5, he said, Tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. The Holy Spirit causes the love of God to flow through us. And we become channels of His love. And His love is an undying love. It's a boundless love. And so He says, it endures all things. Look at verse 8. Love never fails. Never fails. Boy, everything else in this world fails. I just bought some lights down in Ace Hardware. It's supposed to last forever. I put them in, put three of them in, two of them burned out in the first month. They fail. You buy anything in this world, it's going to fail. It's just the way it is. You fails. But he said, here's one thing. The love of God in us cannot fail. Our love that we try to gin up in ourselves will fail. My God, that's flesh. But if the Spirit of God is bearing His fruit of love in us, and the love of God is being shed abroad in us, it will never fail. We'll always be loving. It'll always be kind. It'll always be gentle. Look what else He says about it. Whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Now that word means come to an end. And that it happened when the Bible was completed. There's no more prophecies. Whether it be tongues, they shall cease. That brought, was brought to an end when the Bible was completed. We had the Bible translated into all the different languages. And so he didn't need the tongues. And uh, he said, whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. That's special gifts of knowledge. God said, now you've got the Word. Study the Word to show yourself approved unto God. You've got it here. You don't need anything else. Somebody said to me one time about tongues. Well, don't you believe that God gives special revelation through some of these jibber-jabber? And I, and I said, well, let me ask you a question. If it's already in the Bible, do you need it? And if it's not in the Bible, do you want it? That settles it. Okay. Now, he said, whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, reasoned as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. You know what he's saying? These things in the early church were childish things. These special gifts of prophecy and tongues and knowledge and all that, that was childish things. But now he said, the church is maturing, we have a completed Bible, and so now he said, I put away those childish things. For now we, th we see through a glass, that's a mirror, darkly. Now, the mirrors that they had in this day were polished brass, and, and they, were, they were fairly good, but uh, you really didn't have that image like we have in a mirror today. Boy, I mean, when you see in a mirror today, you see every little old wrinkle and everything. Sometimes you wonder, maybe it'd be better to have a glass that you can see through dimly. But uh, the, the glass they had was a glass that you could look, and the reflection wasn't a perfect reflection. Now notice what he said. He said, now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. When I have a Bible in front of me, I can study the Word of God, and I can see what God wants to reveal to my heart by the Spirit of God. He shines the light on the Scriptures. He shines the light on Jesus. And we have that which the Old Testament saints would have loved to have had. 
We have the blessed Holy Spirit as our guide and our teacher. Now he said, abideth faith. Oh, how important faith is. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. He that comes to him must believe that he is and is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Oh, how important it is. Have faith in God, Jesus said. Important. You're saved by faith, by grace. And you receive that grace by faith when you say, yes, I trust you, Jesus. And he saves you by his grace. Listen, faith is so very important. Oh, he says, now by the faith and hope, hope's a great thing. You know, there's a little bit of difference between faith and hope. Let me illustrate this way. Jesus said, I'm coming again. Does everybody believe that? He said, I will come again, that where I am there you may be also. Jesus said, I'm going to go to prepare a place for you. And he said, I'm coming. And now that's faith to believe that. I have faith that the word of God's true. Jesus is coming. But hope means I am anticipating it and I'd like for it to happen today. Amen. See, that's hope. And so I have my hope in the Lord. And I hope to see Jesus even today. And so faith abides. Hope abides. And then he said, Love expressed. Charity. Love in action. Oh, that abides. These three. But the greatest of these is love. It's the greatest of all because it's the one thing, listen, it's the one thing that's going to last for all eternity. Faith will give way to sight. Hope will give way to reality. Love will continue forever. God is love. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your precious word. Oh, Father, thank you that the Spirit of God inspired the writers and now can be our teacher and help us to understand it.